Mark chapter 6. We'll be in verses 45 through 46 today. And let me turn this little guy on. Uh, let's pray one more time. Father, oh, thank you that you really love us, God. <laughs> thank you that you really, really love us. Today, Lord, we love you back. We love you back. Lord, the ancient rabbis used to teach that the highest honor and the best way to worship Jehovah God was to sit under a tree and open the scroll, open the Bible, open the scriptures, and just study and read it. That was the best way that they could think of to worship. So, Lord, today we're going to continue with our worship, Lord, as we dive into your word. We believe that it is true, it is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, would you cut through uh, the morrow of the stuff going on in our lives today and get to the heart of where we're at, that you would be glorified, that we might leave this place more in love with you and closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Mark chapter 6. Let's, uh, let's start there at verse 45. Here we go. Immediately, remember, if you remember the very first uh, message we had in the gospel of Mark as we're making our way through, I told you that Mark is the gospel where he constantly uses that word, immediately. It's like Mark is in a rush. It's always Jesus immediately went here, and then boom, he was over there, and then wow, he was over there. And it's just like, it's a moving book. So here it is again. He says, immediately. If you guys remember last time, he, he fed uh, 5,000 men. We don't know how many women and children were there, but he fed them miraculously from a little boy's lunch. So it says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. Just a couple things I want to point out here today that I, I just think is really, really cool. And, and first is this. Um, Jesus dismisses the crowd. He, he makes his disciples get on a boat. He uh, recognized, we talked about it last week, that, that he had previously, earlier in the chapter, had sent his disciples out by twos to go out and minister. And they had seen God do amazing things through their lives. And yet when they came back, Jesus looked at them. He recognized that they needed a break, that they needed some rest. And so they got into a boat. They went across the lake or the Sea of Tiberias, also called the Sea of Galilee. And they would go across this thing, but the people saw him. And they ran around on foot, remember? And they met him at the other side. And so it turned out not to be much of a break for his disciples or for him. He's working all day. He's teaching. They're distributing food at the end of the day. And, and so he sees that they haven't really got the break maybe that they needed. And so he makes them get onto a boat and he sends them off. I, I think it's also cool here how it says that he dismissed the crowd. And then he, it, it goes even further to say that he said goodbye to them. And I just think that's neat. As a pastor myself, um, I, I love, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, if you guys ever go to like Christian concerts or you go and hear like a, a big name preacher or evangelist or something, uh, they'll, they'll be there and they draw the big crowds and you hear the music and it's wonderful and awesome and, and, uh, and then they pack up everything and they leave town and they go to the next place. They're sort of on tour. We, we call it like this. We say they blow in, they blow up, and then they blow out. Right? So I you, Jesus wasn't like that. I love it. He blew in. He blew up. But then he stops and he dismisses. You guys go get on the boat. And then he takes the time to say goodbye. I'm picturing like the old, you know, the pastor would stand at the front door of the little church. And he'd shake every person's hand. And like, oh, God bless you this week. Oh, that was a great sermon, pastor. All right, really? What did I say? I don't know. I don't know. Good sermon, though. That's why I don't do that. I don't stand by the front door. Although it'd be kind of funny. What did I talk about today? I don't know, man. I don't know. The lady in front of me had some cool hair, though. <laughs> Jesus 
Jesus, man, he says goodbye to him. I'm picturing like, can you imagine how long that must have taken? You know, we just read that. It's just so cool. It's just a little personal touch I see about the Lord, man. I look at that. I think he didn't blow in, blow up, and blow out, man. He took time personally to uh, even say goodbye to the people. I just think that's cool. And then we're told that he goes up to the mountain to pray. We've already talked about this uh, region of Galilee. And if you go there even today, there's really not what I would call mountains coming from Colorado. <laughs> Uh, more like hills, uh, but he goes up this hill, um, sort of what you guys call mountains here. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Not really. All right. Verse 47. Well into the night, the boat was in the middle of the sea. This is the boat with the disciples on it. And Jesus was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Very early in the morning, Jesus came towards them, <laughs> walking on the sea. He wanted to pass by them. I like that. Jesus is, we're told specifically, on this mountain, and he's praying. And yet, apparently, from his vantage point, he can also see the lake. And he can see his boys out there, and they're struggling at the oars. The wind is against them, and they're going for it. Jesus is up on the mountain. He's praying, but apparently he can also see that these guys are, are really struggling. I, I love that idea that while Jesus is praying, he sees them. In the, in the Bible, God has a lot of names that he's referred to. Our women right now at Palmyra Grace are going through a Bible study on Tuesdays that deals with the names of God, the different names of God. There's many names of God. One of God's Hebrew names is El Roy, spelled E-L-R-O-I, El Roy. And in Hebrew, what that means is, my God sees. I love that. God was given that name by a woman named Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. And if you know her story, she was the maidservant of uh, Abram, who would become Abraham. Abram's wife's name was Sarai, and she had a maidservant. Her name was Hagar. But Sarah and Ab or Sarai and Abram couldn't have children. And so Sarai comes up with this brilliant idea, right? Why don't I have my husband lay with my wife, or with my maidservant, and then the baby that's born to her can be attributed to me, and I'll finally have some children. Not really a great idea, Sarah, but she does it anyway. So Hagar, you know, she's got to do what she does, and she becomes pregnant with a child. Immediately, the Bible says that Sarai, her master, begins to treat her really, really bad. Like, you know, I don't know if she's physically beating her or whatever, but she despises her. She's, I think, jealous of her that now she's got her husband's baby. And so everything doesn't go as planned, just like many of our plans sometimes. I don't know about you. I have plans. They don't always go so good. Amen, Kelly? Never mind. All right. So what happens? Hagar runs off into the desert. She's running away from this abuse that she's enduring. She's out in the middle of the desert. She's there by herself. She's pregnant. She doesn't know how she's going to feed herself. She's literally at the end of her rope in life. And the Lord visits her out there. And he says, listen, I see you. I, I know your situation. And, and, and the Lord begins to give her vision. You know, the Bible says without vision, people are, perish. He, the Lord begins to give her vision for her life and for the life of the baby in her womb. And he encourages her to go back home, and she does. But before she does, in Genesis chapter 16, she said, you are, and she's talking about the Lord. She's talking to the Lord. She says, you are El Roy in Hebrew. You are the God. You see me. Isn't that awesome? Do you understand that whatever you're going through, whatever I may be going through today, we have a God who sees us. He sees what you uniquely are struggling with. Just as Jesus looked down and he could see these guys struggling at the oars, the wind is against them. Jesus, our Lord, our captain, he looks down and he sees that we're struggling in this life. He sees all the things that are against us. And I also love how the text here tells us that Jesus was up there praying. He's praying and he is seeing. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, 
Verse 34, a very famous verse. You guys know this one. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more. Am I there? That's not it, is it? Sorry, let me go. I don't have it. Okay, forget it. Listen to me. I don't have it up there. Romans 8, 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, he has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. God is literally raised up to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God, and he is praying for you now. So not only does he see what I'm going through, you know, and by the way, can I tell you, uh, you know, I work on these messages earlier in the week. <laughs> you know what I mean? I start on Monday, and I'm writing notes down and things that come to my mind, and I'm studying different things, and well, how can I talk about Jesus walking on the water? Every time I hear that sermon, it's always about fixing your eyes on Christ like Peter sunk in the water. So I'm like, how can I, God, what are you saying to me? And I'm taking notes, and I'm writing down these things, and God's always, always, always speaking to me first before I ever get a chance to stand up in front of you guys. And so we're going through something right now. My wife and I, my wife, her mother passed away yesterday. And so we're going through this thing. And, and I was telling Kelly, I was like, okay, listen, you're going to hear me preaching today. I didn't know that this was happening in our life. But it's happening in our life. I know I say this a lot. You're going to hear me say it a lot more. I am amazed at wherever I am in God's word is where I am in life. It's weird. It's like if when I'm going through something, if I'll take the time to open up God's word, I'm telling you, more often than not, I find that it is speaking to exactly where I'm at. And I'm talking to myself, I'm talking to my wife, and I'm talking to you guys today. We have a God who sees right where we are. His name is El Roy, and he is interceding for us right now. He is praying for you. He is saying, God, don't let Michael blow it. That's his tendency. Oh, come on, Dad. Be there for Michael. Come on, don't let... He's praying. I don't, I don't get that totally, but I appreciate it absolutely. Amen. Oh, man. We have a God who sees us, and he's praying for us, and he knows what we're going through. All right, now we'll go to verse 49. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and they were terrified. Mark leaves no, uh, no little open door at all for anybody to say, well, just a few of them maybe drank too much wine and only a few of them saw him. He says all of them saw him and they were freaking out. Immediately he spoke with them and he said, have courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Great story. You know, we have multiple gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In two of the other gospels, this story is there. And uh, in those stories, we read that something else happened. Mark leaves it out of his uh, picture of the story that he's giving to us, his vantage point. And the other part of the story that we all know very well is that at this point, when they were freaking out, and Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid, it's me, uh, have courage. At this point, Peter was in the boat, and remember, he yelled out, and he said, if it's really you, Lord, then call me out. I want to play. And so Jesus is like, come on, Peter. And Peter steps out of the boat, and he walks on water, right? And then the Bible says that he saw the wind and the waves, and it kind of freaked him out, and he, and he looked away from Jesus, and he sunk right? And uh, the message is always, we got to fix our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. We keep our eyes on Jesus so that we don't sink. When we do, we look at the material things, we sink. How many of you have heard sermons like that? Right. How many of you have preached sermon? Okay. Great sermon. It's totally true. I thought it was interesting that Mark doesn't put that part in this story. And then I remembered, if you remember from our very first study in the Gospel of Mark, most Bible scholars don't really think it's the Gospel of Mark. They think it's the Gospel of Peter. Because Mark wasn't one of his disciples. Mark, Mark, uh, Mark was one of Peter's followers. And so more than likely, Peter is relaying the story, and Mark is writing it down, obviously, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it funny that Peter leaves out the part where he sunk in the water? <laughs> I would totally do that. <laughs> Not really sure why Mark leaves it out, but maybe. I just think it's funny. All right, let's keep going. Verse 51. Then Jesus gets into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. That's cool. They were completely astounded. 
Astounded in the original language means astounded, blown away. They, had their, they were just, they could not believe it because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. And, and literally what that means is that they still were reeling and not understanding the miracle that Jesus had done with the little boy's lunch by feeding everybody. They weren't getting it. At this time, who Jesus was, they're just blown away. Now today, this story speaks many things. We could probably spend two months just preaching on this one passage of scripture. It shows us many things. The least of which is the fact that I think our God, our Jesus, is unsinkable. Amen? You ain't sinking Jesus. I, I told you on Easter Sunday, I told a story of um, a Sunday school teacher. I'm going to tell you another one now. So I, hear, I, I read the story where, where the Sunday school teacher is teaching nine and ten-year-olds. And uh, so she goes into her class, but she's late. And so someone was kind of filling in. They had the kids praying, waiting for the teacher to show up. So she walks into the room just in time to hear the end of one of the nine-year-old kids in the class praying. And the nine-year-old's prayer was something like this. Dear Lord, bless mommy and bless daddy. And bless our brothers and bless our sisters and bless our teachers. Get her here safely, Lord. And Lord, bless the police officers and bless all the firefighters and Lord bless the first responders bless the president of the United States Lord and oh yeah by the way Lord bless yourself take care of yourself because if you if you go down we're all sunk I love that if you go down we're all sunk Jesus is unsinkable man Jesus ain't going down amen our Lord is a savior in the storm. Absolutely. Many songs are sung about this. I was listening to that song this week by Third Day that we praise him in the storm. If you've ever heard that song, it's an incredible song. Like, we get it. Our God knows where we're at. He's watching us. He loves us. He's praying for us. And in our darkest hour, in the most uh, dangerous of times, our God can come in and rescue us. He is a savior in the storm. But today I want us also to see something else. Not only is Jesus the savior in the storm, but he is the creator of the storm. You say, Michael, what are you talking about? Jesus creating a storm that he would send his disciples into is very interesting to me. See, we believe something called the Trinity. At our men's breakfast yesterday, uh, our speaker, Gary, shared about this idea of the Trinity. And it's always fun to try to explain uh, this idea that we have in Christianity that there's one God, but he makes himself very real in three distinct personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's always interesting. It's fun uh, to watch people sweat as they try to teach that. But Gary did a great job. But here's the idea. We believe in something called the Trinity. That means that we believe that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all one in the same. Amen? Okay? So we could talk a lot about that. But if that's true, and it is true, it means that Jesus is God. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say in um, John chapter 10, verse 30, it's a verse that I memorized a long time ago, uh, so whenever Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons would come to my door, I know, John 10, 30, John 10, 30, Jesus said, this his words, I and the Father are one. Everybody here can memorize that. I and the Father are one. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. Well, that doesn't make sense. I thought he was all man. He was all man. He's also all God. And if he's all God, do you understand that that means he created everything? As a matter of fact, the New Testament tells us that from the foundations of the world, he was there. Jesus was there. Isn't that interesting? Got to read through Colossians chapter 1 sometimes. It'll blow your face off. Because it's all about Jesus. You know, um, if Jesus is God and he created everything, then that means that Jesus controls weather. God controls weather. Do you guys know that God controls the weather? Okay. Well, I can tell you don't believe me. So what I'm going to do, there's so many scriptures, but I just have six up here. I won't even read them all, but I'm going to read them fast. I'll give you a couple of them. Jeremiah 10:13. When God thunders, 
The waters in the heavens are in turmoil, and he causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings the wind from his storehouses. He does that. We have Psalm 147. There's a lot of scripture here. I know it's really small for everybody over 40. But I'll read to you from Job chapter 37. Listen to this. He, that is God, unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. He says to the snow, fall on the earth. And to the rain shower, he says, be a mighty downpour. I like that. The breath of God produces ice and the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. At his direction, they swirl around over the face of the whole earth to do, listen to this, whatever he commands them to do. He brings the clouds to punish men or to water his earth and show his love. Isn't that good, man? God controls the weather. Amos here says, you know, you can pray to God to do that. Zechariah 10, 1, ask the Lord for rain in the season of spring rain. The Lord makes the rain clouds. I, we could go on. There's so many scriptures. I remember uh, growing up in Fresno, California, and uh, I've told you stories about being a pastor's kid there in Fresno, but I remember it was a little country church, and we had cotton farmers that came to our church. Cotton was a big deal there uh, in that part of uh, California. And then also we had um, vineyards and raisin people, uh, raisin farmers, okay? So we had cotton farmers, and I remember we had a prayer meeting one night, and someone stood up and said, please, you know, pastor, would you pray for rain? Like, we, if we don't get rain for our grapes and our raisins, man, we're going to lose our money. And someone else stood up and said, Lord, please, you know, we pray that it wouldn't rain, because if it rains on our cotton, we're done. And I remember as a kid sitting in that little church going, hmm, God. <laughs> right? It's like the Super Bowl. Who are you going to vote for, Lord? Both teams seem to have a Christian quarterback. <laughs> Apparently, it's always the Chiefs. But, <laughs> oh, man, he loves that team, doesn't he? And so we would pray, God, let it rain on that part of town, and don't let it rain on that part of town. I, I wish I could say I remember what happened. I don't know. But I know this. God is in control of the weather. And if he's in control of the weather, and our text says that immediately Jesus made his disciples go smack dab into the middle of a storm, I have a question. And it's what we're going to talk about today. Here's my question. Why would Jesus create a storm and then send his disciples to go smack into it? Why does God allow the wind to buffet up against me, the things in life, to come against my small boat of a life? Why does he allow you and your small boat for the Lord to come buffeting against you? Why would he create a storm for us to go through? I'm going to give you four reasons today why I believe Jesus, our good captain, our savior in the storm, is also the creator of the storm, okay? And we'll go quick. You guys ready? Four things. Here we go. Number one, he creates storms to give us new direction. I love this passage. Again, this is another one from Psalm 100, or it's from Psalms. It's Psalms 107. It talks about him being the creator of the storm. But listen to this. It says, others went to sea in ships, conducting trade on the vast water. These are sea people, okay? These are, uh, you know, sailors, we would say, professionals. They saw the Lord's works, his wondrous works in the deep. He spoke and he raised a stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea, rising up to the sky. Like imagine being on a boat and the waves are coming and you're rising up to the sky and then sinking, you slam, the boat slams down, sinking down to the depths. Their courage, it says, melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard and all their skill was useless. So, what he's saying is that God brought in the storm, these waves that were taking the ships up and down, and these professional sailors, this is what they do for a living. They're literally melting with anguish, or the word is fear. They're, they, these guys, this is what they do for a living. They're professionals at it. And yet, when the storm takes over, man, they begin to melt with anguish. Why in the world would God do that? Listen to this. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. 
God allows these things to buffet against them, and then they cry out to the Lord. The Lord gang will create storms to cause sailors to be at their wit's end in life. Sometimes for us today, we sort of like to say something like this. I'm the captain. I'm in charge of my own life. I'm the master of my own fate. I'm in charge of everything. I'll decide. I'll go to work and work harder if we need more money. I'll have to go get another job if that's what's needed. I am the master of everything. I make my own decisions for my own life. Until a storm suddenly and savagely comes into your life. And then, then, God allows those things so that then we can cry out to him. The one who previously you didn't have time for, all of a sudden you have time for. Anybody ever notice that? The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that it's, and I, I prayed it earlier, but it says that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance or the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. In other words, when I see how good God is by sending his one and only son to perform the heist, right? To die for my sins, steal my heart. When I see what God has done, I appreciate his goodness and his kindness to me so much, it makes me want to turn from the life that I was living and repent and follow him. It's his goodness. That is ideally how it should happen. But can I be honest with you today? Sometimes practically it doesn't always go down like that. Sometimes the God, the Lord is so good to people and his goodness is there and people don't give a rip. God just is continually kind. He's continually good and they keep continually going in their own direction. So God in those times, it's perfect, it's better, it's ideal when it's his goodness that causes us to repent. But I'm just being honest with you, look around. Sometimes his goodness doesn't cause people to repent. And so in those moments, God allows a storm to come in and he allows them to go up and slam and all that kind of stuff that people feel. Why? That he might give them a new direction in life. Jesus said later on in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole stinking world? My translation. But he, come on, he loses what? His soul. What's he saying there? He's like, listen, you can be so caught up in dealing with the material stuff in this world that you lose your soul. Gang, this is such a strong principle, but you gotta hear this, man. God will allow a storm into your life and into my life at times to send us into a new direction that he, need, he has for us. Absolutely. But he does it because God is more concerned with your eternal state than he is with your present comfort. So I'm going to say that again. He allows the storm in your life because he's more concerned with where you end up in eternity than how comfortable you are now. And I know that flies in the face of the prosperity type teaching that God just wants everybody to be happy and, you know, enjoy. and Everything's great and hunky-dory. And if you come to Jesus, you'll never have any problems. Ah, be careful of that message. God gives way more concern towards your eternal state, towards your children's eternal state, towards your neighbor's eternal state than he does for their present comfort. And so at times in our life, he will allow a storm in there to the winds to be we struggle at the oars. We're going against it. Why? Because he's wanting to send us into a new direction. He wants us to care more about him. And so we come to our wit's end in order that we might call upon him and change our direction. Amen? All right, number two, quickly. He creates storms, not just to give us new direction, but to give us necessary correction. We all know the story of Jonah and the whale, this uh, here is from chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. I'll read it to you. I called to the Lord in my distress. This is Jonah talking. And he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. That's a huge fish. <laughs> um, but it was like hell to Jonah. And you heard my voice when you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas. The current overcame me. All of your breakers, that's waves, and your billows swept over me. 
What's the story of Jonah? We all know it. God wanted Jonah to go to a town called Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah rebelled against God, okay? And, and so God had to correct Jonah, right? And so what does he do? Jonah goes to a port. He finds a ship there, and it's going in the opposite direction of Nineveh. It's headed to a place called Tarshish, and Jonah gets on the ship. And by the way, can I just say, it's always that way. Isn't it interesting that whenever you want to rebel against God, whenever you want to backslide against God, whenever you want to turn your back on God, Satan will always have a ship there ready for you. It'll, it'll be, sails will be good to go. The engines are revved. Everybody's ready. It's not like, you know, you, you decide you want to rebel or you just want to turn away from God for a little bit. It's not like Satan's going, oh, Oh, Michael changed his mind. Man, I wish there was a... Anybody have a ship here ready? No, man. It is good to go. Sails are up. It's ready to go. He'll always have a ship ready to take you in the opposite direction. The problem is, gang, like Jonah, you're going to pay for it. Whoa! I love the verse. You can, I don't have it up here. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. It says that he was going the opposite direction. Jonah 1, 3. He went to the port and he found a ship. And then it says, and he paid the fare. That'll preach. He found a ship and he paid the fare. It's just like me um, trying to think of an illustration for this. Because Satan will always have a ship ready for you if you want to turn your back on God. Jesus kind of mentioned it like the way is wide for those that want to go to destruction, but it's really hard, you know, narrow. It's sort of like this. If I'm trying to lose weight, okay, and I'm, trying, I'm working on trying to lose weight and eat better and everything, but I get up early in the morning, and I'm driving down 422. I'm driving down Main Street, okay, and I see this place called uh, the filling station, okay? <laughs> now, for those online watching all over the world, the filling station is this incredible little restaurant that we have here in Palmyra, Pennsylvania, um, that creates these little demonic donuts <laughs> that are so good. Amen? Yay! Yeah. <laughs> hey. All right. So I'm trying to lose weight, right? I'm trying to lose weight, but I have to find myself going down 422, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm about to pass the filling station. You know what? I know I'm trying to eat better. I know, but Lord, I just feel... I feel like it might just be your perfect will, Lord, for me to get a donut from the filling station, right? Like, I just, man, I'm sensing it in my spirit, Lord. It's like, oh, wow, the presence is here. I'm feeling like you want me to have a donut. Like, forget it. Like, I don't even, you might even not even allow it to add weight to me. I mean, I just feel it, Lord. And so here's, here's what I pray. I pray, okay, God, I'm going to go by. Here's, here's Lord, I'm going to know. I'm going to put a fleece, you know. That's what Gideon did. He, so, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a fleece. Look, if I drive by the filling station and there's a parking space that's open <laughs> anywhere in the front, like anywhere there, there's like eight or nine. If there's a parking space there open, Lord, and then I know it's your will, God, for me to park the car, go in, pay the price. And get the donut, Lord. Like, I'm going to, and I won't even gain weight. Okay? Well, you know what's funny is that, sure enough, after three or four times around the block, <laughs> there's a space open. Praise God. It was your will. So stupid. Maybe you're listening to me today. And some of you, you are circling around the block right now. You're saying, Lord, you know, if you want me, maybe you're single. Man, you want me to date that girl or you want me to date that guy. And, and God, if it's your perfect will, I know you're going to make it so that, you know, today it doesn't rain. <laughs> That's so cool. I looked on my phone earlier, but whatever. Okay, God. Or, God, if you want me to buy this thing that costs a lot of money or whatever, and I, I know I kind of feel like maybe you didn't want me to, but, but Lord, if it's your perfect. Listen, there will always be a ship in port ready to take you away from the way that the Lord is directing your life. It's easy. I'm just telling you. And maybe there's someone listening to me right now. God has called you to something. He has called you to something, but you've had every excuse or whatever. Listen, it's time to understand the calling of God 
the word of God, the calling of God, he never takes it back, the Bible said. It's irrevocable. He's called you to something. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, he's allowed a storm into your life right now to wake you up and to remind you of what the call is to get you back, amen? Into correcting, correcting you to get, to get things in order. All right, let's keep going. Hopefully that made sense. That makes sense? Cool, all right. Excellent. It's cool, my wife's holding a baby. It's really neat. All right, okay, let's keep going. Number three. <laughs> ADHD. You guys ever seen a pastor with ADHD? Yes, you have. All right. Number three, he creates storms to give us needed protection. John 6, 14. This is the passage where Jesus has just fed the 5,000, except it's John's account. John lets us in on a detail that Mark didn't. Listen to this. When the people saw the sign, that is the multiplying of the fish and the bread to feed everybody, that Jesus had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, listen to this, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. See, Mark didn't let us in on that. That the people wanted by force to make Jesus the king. The people saw what Jesus could do, how he had this welfare program that could just feed all the poor people. We need to make him our leader, not Caesar, not Herod. We need Jesus to be the leader. Then we're going to make him do it. So Jesus understands that this is what they're going to do. So what does he do? He puts his disciples, who by the way, to the disciples, that would have been awesome news. Like this would have been the day they were waiting for. Oh, we've been following this guy for all this time, and now he's going to take over Rome, and we're his right-hand man. You guys with me? Like they would have seen all their dreams, their secular dreams, come true. And so Jesus realizes that. So he makes them get on a boat. He sends them into a storm. Interesting. (sighs) Knowing that that would sound like the moment that the disciples had been waiting for all their life. Jesus sends them away, I believe, for their own protection. I was reading this week about this fire department who got a bunch of fire helmets in the mail. They had ordered them, and they were the newest thing on the market. They were bright yellow, and they were really bright. They had lights on them, and they had a cool strap that no one has ever had before, and they were scuff-proof, and they were beautiful. Each one came with a $500 price tag to these helmets. One problem, when you get the helmet near heat, it melts. (laughs) Sort of a bummer. Sort of a bummer. (laughs) Um... I wonder if God says sometimes to us, you know, Michael, it's great. You're getting your house in order. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, you got your nice, shiny little Harley Davidson motorcycle, and you've got your car. You've got your hobbies, and that's wonderful. You put so much energy and so much time into this gizmo and that gadget, and you're so excited about whatever the thing is. You know what? I I need you to be thinking about me and my kingdom and not you and your kingdom. Does that make sense? So sometimes God sends the storms into our life to literally protect us, can I say, from ourselves, from the interests that I have. I can be so carnally minded that I'm not thinking spiritually about the Lord. Does that make sense? Say carnally minded. Carnally just means flesh. Like when you eat chili con carne, you know what that means? You're eating beans with flesh. Ho, ho, ho. Chili con carne. Carne comes from the root word that we get for flesh. So when God says you're thinking carnally, what's he saying? You're thinking materially. You're thinking with your carnal mind. And I don't need you thinking like that. I need you thinking about my kingdom first and foremost. And so we're going to send something in here, literally, to protect you. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 12 there, but it says that our lives, gang, man, you gotta hear this, our lives are one day are going to be tested at the judgment seat of Christ and everything that is made of wood, hay, and stubble will burn up. And only the things that are made with precious stones, silver, and gold will remain. Now, I don't pretend to totally know what that means, 
except that I think it means that the things that I'm doing for the kingdom, the things that I'm doing for God in his name, for his glory, are the things that will last. When you and I stand before that seat of Christ, he is going to look and we're going to, listen, are you going to have a crown uh, that's full of the jewels and the precious stones to throw at his feet and say, God, you're my king. Anything that I ever gained in life, anything that I ever worked for is for you, God. I just throw it at your feet, all crowns at your feet. Or you're just going to have wood, hay, and stubble. Here's my little gizmo that I was really excited about. Here's this video game that I spent way too much time on. Here's my awesome Harley. Oh, this was great. Isn't it awesome? Look, it all burns up. And the Lord loves us too much to allow that to continue in our life. So what's he do? He says, Michael, to get your mind off of the material world, I am sending you into a storm where you will wrestle with some issues. You will struggle with some difficulties. But I'm watching you. I see you, buddy. I'm praying for you. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually living inside of you <laughs> to help you. What a good God we have, amen? So that your focus will shift from the carnal and the temporal to the eternal. Amen. Last one and we're all done. Number four, he also creates storms to nurture perfection. I don't have as much time, so I'm going to skip reading all this. Let me just tell you what this says. The early church was growing. And they were adding to their number all the time. And verse 4 here, the very end of this, says that many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. That number sound familiar to anybody recently? Five, how many people were fed by Jesus? It tells us men, 5,000. So that just stood out to me. The number, 5,000, and it says men. We don't know how many women and children. It just says men. Maybe that's all mankind. We don't know. It's actually not the word used for mankind. So it, probably there was more. But it, for some reason, we're given the number 5,000. And I was playing with that in my mind. Because after Jesus fed 5,000 people, he sent his disciples into a storm, and then he ascended up into a mountain to pray, we're told. I'm wondering if what God was doing was preparatory, if he was preparing his disciples for the future event that would happen in Acts chapter 4 when, when 5,000 people would not be fed physically, but they would be saved spiritually, and then Jesus would not ascend up into a mountain, but he would ascend up into heaven. And then you see the greatest storm of persecution come on the early church after Acts chapter 4. And so I'm thinking to myself, isn't this, I wonder if this whole thing was to prepare the disciples. I'm going to feed the 5,000 miraculously, I'm going to ascend, and I'm going to send you into a storm. Years later, just a few years later, 5,000 people again getting saved, Jesus ascends into heaven, and he sends them into a huge storm of persecution. Hmm. I told you last week to look at your neighbor and say, Jesus knows what's going to happen. I'm going to say it again. God is our captain, and he sees what tomorrow holds in your life. And that's why he says, as difficult as it may seem, it is absolutely necessary to prepare you and perfect you for what's coming. Can I say, gang, that I've seen this throughout my life. God allows the storm in my life, and then years later, sometimes, I find out, what he was preparing me for. Does that make sense? And if you think back in your life, it's the same way. I've told you some of my story. One of my stories is I went to a Christian school at one point. I went to six high schools. But one, my junior year, I was in a Christian school and I got expelled from that Christian school. Oh, <laughs> still want me as your pastor? I got expelled. I was falsely accused, but nobody believed me, not even my parents. My mom and dad both worked at the Christian school and they were both fired the same day because they didn't know how to raise their kid. So I, I was so angry. I was so mad at Christians, at God, because I didn't do what they said I did. There was no proof whatsoever. And two weeks later, the truth came out. Some other kids were lying, and uh, letters of apology came, and they wanted us to come back. We never did. But I'm telling you, something broke in my heart as a junior in high school. I was mad at Christians. I thought they were a bunch of phonies. And so 
Uh, I went through that story. I never understood why. Why did you allow me to go through that? I was falsely accused, and even when the truth came out, why did that happen? Then years later, I went to school for a long time. I became a youth pastor, and uh, we were youth pastoring, and Kelly and I get called into the senior pastor's office, and the whole board, they had eight guys on the board, were all sitting around there, and he said, hey, we're going to let you go uh, because of such and such. And I was like, we never did that. And he goes, yeah, um, you did this, and so you're out. And uh, we were sobbing, you know, we, we didn't understand, we didn't do what we were doing. But I'm telling you, I remember God whispering in my heart, I've prepared you for this. Just keep your mouth shut. So I did. We didn't say anything. They even asked us to leave the city. They said, you have too much influence here, we need you to leave the city. And I was young, I was like, okay, whatever, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna submit to what God says. And we left the city. One year later, the senior pastor was in prison. He had totally lied about us. Every board member wrote a letter of apology to us. One drove all the way out to where we were living in Kansas City and apologized. And I remember when that happened, I, you know, I, oh, huh, that's right. I was right the whole time. But it wasn't like that. It was like God had already prepared me. I'm telling you, sometimes God allows you to go through really, really hard storms because he's preparing you for something in the future. Does that make sense? And I'm not trying to bum you out here. It's a wonderful thing that the Lord does so that we'll be ready. What do we do? I have one minute. What do we do? Should we freak out? Should we give up? Should we hop on a ship, go in the opposite direction? The answer is no, we shouldn't. We should follow the disciples' example for us here. And gang, if you're going through a storm right now, embrace the storm and know that you have a God who is a savior in the storm. Absolutely. He sees you. He's praying for you. He lives inside of you, okay? But more than that, he might just be creating this storm to do something in you for his greater glory. Isn't that all that matters? The glory of the Father. Amen? Fellow sailors, be of good cheer today, this week. And I know some of us are going through some really tough things right now. Be of good cheer. I trust in God. We started this service singing. Hallelujah, I trust in God. Amen? I trust in God, my Savior, the one. Amen? Oh, man. Father, we love you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for the reminders that many of us know in our hearts, God. We, we know it, but it's always good to be reminded. You're not out, God, to destroy us, to ruin us, God, but you are out to build us into the people that you long for us to be, God, that we might make a difference in the world. God, would you use us in the midst of these storms that we are going through this room, a room this size, an audience this big, represents all kinds of storms that people are going through, God. I pray for each and every person right now and where they're at, God, encourage them. Lord, as we hear you say, don't be afraid, it's I, be of good courage. God, you're still saying that today. You're still the Savior in the storm. Oh, encourage my brothers and sisters today, Lord, that you're with them, you're praying for them, you see them, El Roy. You're the God who sees but Lord, you're also maybe allowing this to change our course a little bit, to draw us closer to you, to open our eyes, God, to things that you want to do, to prepare us. We love you, Lord, and we are yours. We surrender all to you. Our trust is in you alone. Thanks so much for joining us this week. We hope it will help you as you live out your life with God, together, and one mission. We would love to connect and pray with you. Feel free to reach out through our social media pages, website, or in person on Sunday mornings at 9 or 1045 a.m. Hope to see you soon.